Hi, everyone. My name is David. I'm from MIT. Today, I'm here with Vincent from Stanford University. And we're going to be giving a talk on an application of unsupervised learning and latent variable models for the purposes of intuitive physics. OK, so I want to start off with a motivational thought experiment. So imagine we're in the medieval era, and uh, uh, we're a witness observing an archer shooting these arrows of different sizes and shapes. Right? And let's say for now that we didn't have any understanding of the laws of physics. Okay, I would claim that over time, through observation alone, what we can do is begin to intuit certain properties about the arrow that kind of govern the dynamics of the arrow and help us explain and predict its trajectory. Right? So such uh, properties as uh, the arrow's mass or the arrow's drag coefficient. Right? Um, and so uh, this process of discovering object properties from observational data alone, we're going to call this task unsupervised property inference. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. All right, so a quick background on intuitive physics. So intuitive physics has to do with the idea of replicating the human ability to perceive, understand, and then later interact with its physical environment. Uh, so humans are good at many such tasks in the field of intuitive physics, but we're going to look at just uh, two of them today. So on the left here, we have physical property inference. So physical property inference has to do with uh, taking in as input video data of observations, uh, such as uh, a box rolling down a ramp. Uh, this video data can come in two forms. It can either come in the form of a sequence of images, or it can come in the form of a sequence of uh, position and velocity vectors for each object, right? And then uh, the goal in either case is to be able to output uh, the latent properties associated with each object. For example, the object's uh, mass or the object's uh, coefficient of friction. On the right here, we have another example of intuitive physics, more to do with the understanding side of uh, intuitive physics. Um, here we have a forward simulation. So the goal is, given the latent properties of the objects and some sort of initial state of the system, perform a rollout of uh, the object dynamics from the initial state. And by rollout, what I mean is uh, a chain of predictions about the future states using the laws of physics, starting from the initial state. All right, so just as important uh, to doing well in the original task for intuitive physics is the concept of generalization, right? So human intelligence is much more than just pattern recognition. And so uh, as with models in other areas of machine learning, in intuitive physics, it's very important for models uh, to generalize to inputs that are outside of the domain exposed to during training. So here we have a great example of a, a paper that uh, uh, does this kind of generalization. So uh, here, uh, Cheng's paper has to do with uh, creating this physics simulator of objects that move around in a box. Right? And so during training, uh, uh, we, uh, the set of walls exposed to, to the system is not the same as uh, that during testing. But we find that Chang's model works well uh, to new systems uh, with different wall configurations, despite the fact that we did not need to retrain our model. All right, so um, oftentimes we find ourselves uh, with, in intuitive physics with data in which the inputs and outputs can be associated with particular objects. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, state data with position and velocity vectors for each object is one such example. So it makes sense when we're building our model to exploit the structure in, this, in our data. So one such example of this is inter interaction networks. So interaction networks, uh, uh, the idea is to uh, uh, limit ourselves to only using two kinds of functions object-centric functions and relation-centric functions. Object-centric functions uh, are applied to each object, and relation-centric functions are applied to each pair of objects. And so uh, these functions have to be shared across objects and pairs of objects. Right? So the advantage of uh, doing the sharing is that we reduce the number of network weights, and thereby uh, helping us achieve better test performance. And also, uh, because our functions are not specific to any particular object, um, it helps us to generalize to arbitrary numbers of objects. All right, so now let's dive uh, into uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is unsupervised property inference. Um, so the idea of unsupervised property inference is that uh, in our data set, each sample contains videos of object dynamics. Um, 
uh, in particular, in our case, we're just going to work with position and velocity vectors, uh, frames of position and velocity vectors. All right. And so for each sample, the properties of the objects in the system are unknown and randomly selected. Right. And so the model that we created to uh, uh, observe this video and uh, in an unsupervised way do property inference is called a perception prediction network. Okay. Um, so the first module, the perception module, uh, does the actual property inference. So what it does is it takes in the uh, observed data and uh, the first video, and using an interaction network, it predicts property vectors for each object. These property vectors are then passed downstream to the prediction module. The prediction module uh, takes a new initial state and then performs a rollout of the initial state using those property vectors passed from the perception module. Um, and it does this also via an interaction network. So once we've made this rollout prediction on the second video, we can compare it against the true values of the second video uh, during training. So we compare the predicted rollout to the true rollout, and we use the mean squared error of the predicted positions to perform an end-to-end -end training of both the perception and the prediction modules. Okay. So at no point do we actually supply labels for the properties themselves, for the uh, object properties themselves. However, what we find is that uh, after training, what we can do is we can apply unsupervised algorithms to the property vectors. And what we find is that we can actually extract and discover interpretable features of those property vectors using techniques as simple as principal component analysis. So uh, the three scenarios that uh, our uh, model is tested on are the spring scenario. In the spring scenario, um, uh, the underlying object property is a made up uh, property called uh, spring charge. So each pair of objects has a spring attached to it and the uh, spring constant uh, is determined by the product of the two uh, objects spring charge. In the second scenario, we have the perfectly elastic ball scenario. So each object's underlying property in this instance is mass. And so collisions are, uh, the collision dynamics are what you would expect and are based off the masses of the two objects. In the third scenario, we uh, add a second property to show our model's ability to handle multiple properties. Uh, in, in this case, we introduce coefficient of restitution as a second property. So when two objects collide with each other, their coefficient of restitutions help determine the amount of kinetic, kinetic energy that's lost in the collision. Now I'm going to pass it off to Vincent to talk about our experiments and results. All right, thanks. <clears throat> so for all of our experiments, we only trained our model, the PPN, on six object training data sets. Um, but later, we're also going to show some results when we test the PPN on different three and nine ball systems, just to show its ability to generalize to different scenarios. So let's dive right into the results. Firstly, on the side of uh, the unsupervised property inference or discovery. We found that over each scenario, if we applied principal components analysis to the set of property vectors obtained on a test data set after having trained our perception prediction network, we saw, see that the principal components actually correspond directly to human interpretable properties. So firstly, let's take a look at the first row of this table. This is the first principal component of the property vector in all three different situations. And you see that in the springs case, the first principal component, when we regress it against the quantity of log charge, the ground truth property value, it obtains an R squared value of 0.95. It's essentially correlated almost directly with this property of log charge. And in the perfectly elastic balls and inelastic balls cases, you can see that there's a similar trend in which the first principal component corresponds very highly to log mass. Additionally, in the inelastic balls case, where there is a second physical property which is relevant to governing the dynamics of the system, the second principal component of the property vectors corresponds very neatly to co coefficient of restitution. Now, there's an additional subtlety in this table in that the columns marked EVR, that stands for explained variance ratio, and that's the explained variance ratio of each of the different principal components. And you can see that for the springs and perfectly elastic balls cases, the EVR for the first principal component is significantly higher than that of all the others. And in some ways, this provides a further unsupervised manner of 
discovering which principal components correspond to properties which are relevant to predicting the dynamics of the system, and which ones are more likely than not just noise produced by the fact that the property vector is of high dimension. And you notice that this continues with the inelastic balls case in which the first two principal components have a relatively high explained variance ratio, and this indicates that both of those are likely to correspond to meaningful properties. Now, one thing that we mentioned earlier that's important in intuitive physics is generalization. And we show here that the perception side of our network generalizes very well to different numbers of objects. So uh, we trained only on six object data sets. But when we test our perception module on three and nine object data sets, we see that the results are quite good. So the first row of this table, this is just what you saw last slide. This is the R squared values when principal components are regressed against their corresponding physical properties in a six object test set. But you'll notice that in the three and nine object test sets, all of these R squared values are still quite high. and indicates that the inference is capable of generalizing to scenarios with different numbers of objects. Similarly, on the prediction side, we show that our PPN can act as a very good physics engine, even in situations that have different numbers of objects than what was seen previously. So the metric that we use to compare models in this regard is the mean Euclidean prediction error. And by this, I mean if you take the difference between real versus predicted positions in uh, any simulation, average them across all objects, and average them across the entire test data sets, that's the metric that we use to compare different models. And here, we're going to compare our model to two different baselines. Firstly, there's the mean properties perfect rollout baseline. In this baseline, we assume that all objects have their mean property values. So for instance, in the case of the um, perfectly elastic balls, we would assume that all of the balls have the same mass. And then we use our physics engine to simulate perfectly what a rollout would look like, what a sequence of frames would look like under this assumption that they all have the mean property values. And this is essentially a measure of almost the best that you can do without assuming, if you don't use a latent variable model in this case. This is like a perfect rollout, but without the physical properties. And as a second uh, uh, baseline, we use this ground truth properties interaction network. And this is only the prediction half of our perception prediction network. So exactly the same architecture, except rather than having our perception network feed in property vectors into the prediction network, instead, we have the ground truth property values fed directly into the prediction network. And this is a measure of the best that our model can do. This is if the perception half is performed perfectly, how well can you do at pr pr prediction? So this is the second baseline. And here you can see some examples of uh, you know, uh, true dynamics compared with our model dynamics in the three different situations. All right, so now let's talk about uh, the generalization. Um, firstly, in the six ball case, if you look at these two graphs, which are for the springs and inelastic balls universes, you'll notice that the PPN outperforms the mean properties perfect rollout baseline in both cases. This means that the introduction of latent variables into our modeling and specific incorporation used in the PPN it allows it to beat out a model that is otherwise perfect without the, um, but doesn't assume the presence of these physical properties. And similarly, in the three and nine ball cases, you see that this pattern continues to be the case. And in some cases, you know, it is a quite significant difference between the performance of the mean properties perfect rollout baseline and the PPN. And in all cases, of course, our ground truth interaction network is performing the best as expected. Whoa. So we also did an additional experiment to show that our model could generalize well to property values, which were outside the range seen during training. So in these two charts, what you see is um, a plot of predicted charge versus true charge and predicted mass versus true mass. When we tested on new uh, unseen trajectories in which the objects have mass values or charge values outside of the green zone. So the green zone is the zone that of values, the range of values that was seen during training. And you'll see that even outside of the range seen during training, on mass, the inference is quite good on, on these ranges. And in springs, you'll see the inference is quite good on the higher end, not so great on the lower end. But this is uh, explained largely by the fact that for objects that have a low spring charge, they interact very low to very low levels with ob other objects like 
almost not interacting with them at all. And so it's very difficult to distinguish the nuances at this lower side. So this is still quite a reasonable result. In conclusion, we've shown that interaction networks can be used both for the physical perception and prediction tasks. And notably, um, the unique combination of perception prediction networks that we've explored in our work, uh, they can accomplish three really important tasks. The first thing, which is really cool, is that they can discover these object properties without the need for supervision. So in the completely unsupervised manner, they recover properties which at times are human, directly human interpretable, as we saw with log mass, log charge, and coefficient of restitution. Secondly, they serve as a good physics engine in the sense that they can predict these complex object dynamics even in the presence of latent object properties, and they can serve well just for this purpose alone. And third, they have very desirable generalization properties in that they generalize to novel scenarios without the need to, for retraining. We saw that they generalize to different numbers of objects and also to property values outside the range seen during training. All right, thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Thank <clears throat> you.